Coming up next, the bookening reads Martin Dresler. Of the booking. This is Nathan Robertson, your humble and obedient host, welcoming you to an episode in the late 50s, if I'm not mistaken, being recorded in the year 2017, Anno Domini, if that's how you say that. And I just want to welcome you to the show. <coughs> I just want to welcome you into the theater of the mind, the theater of the mind that you are in now. Imagine yourself sitting in a theater and up on the stage. What's that? I was going to say inside of a hotel. Inside of a hotel, yes. Imagine you're on the 13th floor basement level of the Grand Cosmo. If you've read the novel, then you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't read the novel, then... Is there a 13th floor? The Grand Cosmo, each thing he does goes deeper. Yeah, but most hotels actually don't have a 13th floor. Oh, like a... They skip it. That's interesting. I don't... It's from the 12th to the 14th. Right. I don't know uh, what old Martin Dresser The magical 13th floor. Right, so you're in an imaginary 13th floor. You actually are in the 13th floor, sitting in a theater... And who do you see up on the stage? You see a big red velvet curtain. I know that much. The velvet curtain opens and there's a man, a man standing in the shadows wearing a top hat and a frock coat. And he's got uh, a cane and he hobbles forward. And you think, who is this old man? And then he does a cartwheel, Willy Wonka style, rips off his beard and reveals himself to be Brandon Chastine. Hello, children. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, the old son of a sea biscuit? Doing great. Welcome to the theater of the mind that is the bookening. It's amazing. Ah, yeah, that's right. He's Brandon Chastine. He's a scholar who's a baller of reading. An old son of a sea biscuit, as we like to call him around these parts. An old son of a sea biscuit. He's doing well. Right, Brandon? I'm doing fantastic. I'm glad to hear it. Fantastically well. What's new in the world of Brandon Jastine, the world of sea biscuitry? Oh, not much. Not much? Enjoying life. Enjoying life. (laughs) Yes. That's good. That's good. Now, Brandon, something else is happening on this stage right now. What is that? Someone else is emerging from the shadows. Uh Uh-oh. From the wing. Uh Uh-oh. Stage left. Is that to my right? (laughs) Yeah. Stage directions work like the audience, I think. Yeah. You just have to follow the audience. Now, what is this man? Describe this man in the theater of the mind, what he looks like. He's a lanky fellow. Yeah, you're doing good. (laughs) You're doing real well. I've got these uh, dark colored glasses on. You didn't mention those. (laughs) You do have dark colored glasses. Brandon is actually blind. I am. In the theater of the mind. Yep. This man, he's wearing purple spandex. Oh, boy. Maybe I should have done it. (laughs) can jump in anytime. No, no, you go ahead. (laughs) He's got a rainbow-colored wig and a hook for a hand. And he's dashing and prancing about the stage saying, Arr, I'm a pirate. (laughs) Nobody knows why he's doing any of these things. It turns out you, the listener, took several hallucinogenic drugs before entering this theater of the mind. And now there he is. He's ripping off the rainbow wig. He's pulling off the hook. He's ripping off the spandex to reveal it clean cut manly tuxedo manly tuxedo nice a manly tuxedo cut tailored to his frame and his build and who is he you've probably been wondering who this person is well he's got one of those white pastors uh neck things under my tuxedo (laughs) under under, under his tuxedo like a priest like a priest (laughs) okay CREC pastor. CREC pastor? Yeah. But what he actually is, is he's the pastor who's a master of reading, Jacob Menzel. What's up, Nathan? What's up, buddy? Welcome to the theater of the mind. How you like? How you like it here? I don't know. I think I'm just going to withhold my judgment for a while. What's your favorite feature? The red curtain. The red curtain. Yeah, it is nice. It's a nice red curtain. It's a beautiful red curtain. Is this theater full of people? No. No? <laughs> it's completely <laughs> empty. But the show we're putting on is so entertaining. <laughs> Over the marquee of this theater of the mind, there is a thing. Uh-huh. Words, in fact, on this yeah. marquee. And those words say, 
Donor shout outs. Ah, yes. Bright flashing letters. And bright flashing letters. Do you have the donor list? No, you chance? changed. I had the password saved oh. into my computer, and then you changed it all. Oh, that's because so I couldn't get in. All right, one second. Do they make these things called password managers? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I'm all right, logged in. Cool. All right, Brandon, you ready to do some shout outs, my let's, friend? Let's do it. Saturday Night Live style. Shout out. Are you going to do your best? Hey, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should do it like that. Uh, relationship manager. This thing has a relationship manager. Huh. That's sweet. What is this thing? Uh, Patreon.com. All right, let's see here. Shout it out to Benjamin. Benjamin. <laughs> Shout it out to Beth. Beth. Shout it out to Eric and Catherine, the lovebirds. Eric and Catherine, the lovebirds. Shout it out to John and Jill. And and special shout out to their new offspring, Max. John and Jill. And Mac. Gonna, with a, oh, I thought you were going to finish that thought oh, there. I the looked at, I thought, <laughs> I with, a, with a special shout out to Max. Shout it out to, oh, what's his name? What do we call him now? No, he wanted Pro- Professor X. Professor X. And uh, Nathan. 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 Oh, and uh, of course, our favorites. Robert and Rhonda, the lovebirds. Robert and Rhonda, the lovebirds. Mm, that's right. Well, thank you, everybody, for supporting the fine, ongoing work of the booking. Today, we're going to be talking about a book called Martin Dresler. And if you're not supporting us, all you need all you to need. get shout, uh, that wonderful shout out Quality on the show shout-outs. is to give what? It's, it's only $10 a month, right? $10 a month. $10 a month. $10 a month. Oh, that ain't bad. $10 a month. And you can lengthen the beginning of our show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone's favorite part. Uh, what? That's the cost of one book. That's the cost of one book. You don't even have to buy the books. You can just listen to us talk about them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which you couldn't do if you didn't. Yeah. Here's what you do. You listen to the episodes. You find the episode where we say, this book was crap. You don't buy that one. You instead give money to the booking. Although, wait a second. You have to give $10 every month. Well, I don't know. Make your own. Just consult your financial advisor. This is a book for you, a book for us. One for you, one for me. (laughs) One for you, one for... I like that. One for you, two for you, one, two. What kind of things do you spend $10 a month on, Jake? Well, I spend, I think, what, $15 a month on a Spotify membership, Spotify. Fam- family membership. I, I've got myself. $10 a month on Netflix and another $10 a month on Amazon Prime. That's right. Yep. That's right. That's $35 a month right there in subscriptions, none of which are as worthwhile as the booking. That's right. That's no. right. How many things do you really watch on that Netflix? They're getting rid of Disney's. Too many things. Disney's, uh, well, that's not the answer that's helpful to my oh. pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. I don't watch anything. <laughs> you know, I mean, I watch I'm too busy reading books. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right, everybody. We're getting to it. We're getting to it right now. It's Martin Dresler by Stephen Milhauser. And what's that sound? It's the contextual Texan firing off his guns and letting out a hearty inhale. Yeehaw. 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 How do I do an ironic yeehaw? And letting out an ironic yeehaw. 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 <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Ah, uh, yes. An impression of the great Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. You're from Texas. Uh, that's right. And you like to provide some context. I love it. So, in <clears throat> my infinite wisdom, I have deemed you the contextual Texan. That's very wise. Among a... Ab- <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Um, that sounded pretty arrogant. <laughs> it's very wise. <laughs> in, in my infinite wisdom. But I sounded arrogant when I said Or I sounded arrogant saying that was wise. Um, Both were just <laughs> two wild and arrogant guys. Two wild and arrogant guys. <laughs> nope, we're humble. Um, Brennan is going to provide some much-needed context on this work, Martin Dresler, The Tale of an American Dreamer, yeah. a novel by Stephen Milhauser, which the New York Times Book Review calls a wonderful, wonderful book. Like W-O-N-D-R-F-U-L-L? Yeah, like it's wonderful, and it's also... Full of wonder. Full of wonder. Like this room we're in. Like this room we're in, yeah. <clears throat> With the velvet drapes. If you want to see some behind-the-scenes footage of this room, all you got to do is go on Patreon. You can pay like $1 a month for that, probably, or something. I don't know what you can do, but... Uh, it, um, or you can go to Facebook Live. We just post the video there. You can do all kinds of things. Um, anyway, Brandon, take it away with the context, my Texan friend. Context, yeah, so... Let's start where we always start with a little bio f- about the author. 
unfortunately, that means we're going to do very little at the top of the uh, context because there's not a whole lot to say about Stephen Milhauser. He a lot is a lot like some of the more um, modern authors in that he is very private. So I would put him in the category of J.D. Salinger, Thomas Pynchon. He doesn't do a lot of publicity for himself. He's not a recluse level. He's not a recluse. No, but there's, you can find like two pictures of Pynchon, I think, yeah. online or something like that. And That's right. Pynchon's famous for avoiding the public spotlight. And in fact, there's a Simpsons episode where it was famous because they actually got his voice to be on the Simpsons episode, but even his uh, animated character had a paper bag over his face. Yes, 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 yes. So that was that was the end joke for all the smart people who watch the Simpsons, right. I guess. Only whatever. the smartest set. Only the, the smartest, Simpsons. which is why I guess I never watched it. <laughs> <laughs> that was a strange beginning. So I don't know if we'll ever read Thomas Pynchon. We might. I don't know why we would. We'll see. We'll, we'll get to Thomas Pynchon in a bit. There's a reason I keep mentioning him. But so Stephen Milhauser, he's not a recluse, but he certainly doesn't look for the public spotlight. He doesn't try to get himself out there. He's not a Charles Dickens. He's not a um, Stephen King. Stephen King, yeah. Or J.K. Rowling. Mm-hmm. He's not out there trying to get his name known. In fact, he really didn't become famous until around 1997 when he was already well into his 50s because he was born in 1943. And what made him famous is his uh, short stories. And so I think the one that got him his notoriety was The Knife Thrower. The Knife Thrower, yeah, that's a great collection of short stories. And that was around 1997, right after the date of this book we're now reading it. And so then to just take a step back, he was born in 1943, fairly normal upbringing, went to college, graduated, and then went to Brown University where he was working on his PhD, but actually never finished his dissertation. So he was PhD, ABD. He oh, dropped well, there you go. He'd, yeah. <clears throat> So one of, those. <laughs> one of those. We had never met any of those before. No. True story. I was talking to Jurgen von Hagen recently. Uh, for our listeners who don't know, Jurgen is or was the vice president of the university at Bonn. He res- I think he resigned his vice presidency, but he still yeah. teaches economics there and is a visiting professor at IU as well. Pretty world famous economist, actually. If you look up him up and see his CV, it's amazing. But um, he was telling us about about how at Oxford. The PhD is a sign of stupidity, that if you have your PhD, all of the best scholars, all of the smartest people uh, get made fellows of the most prestigious universities in the UK before they finish their PhDs. And so they never finish them. And if you finish your PhD, it's because you were dumb and you had to go on and prove yourself by finishing your your PhD and then use that as a card to get in instead of simply proving yourself uh, and, and being recognized to be brilliant before you had to, before you got that far down the line, <laughs> which is this, uh, that's what happened with Stephen Milhauser and, and with you and with Brandon. Oh yeah, yeah, with me, of course. I'm teaching at Harvard and Yale already, right? We, <laughs> and Stanford. <laughs> um, I always forget to mention that in your bio when I'm introducing you. You'd think I would say Oxford professor Brandon Chastain, but I did not. Yeah. <laughs> We don't need to add more accolades. (laughs) So, but yeah, so he was PhD, ABD, and in his case, it actually, he didn't want to finish his dissertation because he wanted to be a fiction writer. In in college, he was already working on these stories. He was working on the one that would become his first published novel in 1972, Edwin Mulhouse, Mm -hmm. which sounds a whole lot like the book we read today, Martin Dressler. But it was a a picture of of childhood, basically, and a lot of nostalgia and beautiful imagery and the sort of stuff that he would become known for, which is having really evocative language and really evocative imagery that he uses. And through like a scene or a setting, just capturing the essence of this moment. A, a lot like poetry mm-hmm. and a lot like just what the short story is really masterful at doing. And he would become known for his short stories and also then for his novellas and not really for his novels until um, the one that we're reading today, Martin Dressler. So he actually was fa- a fairly obscure writer, one who was liked by the people who were in the know. I was reading this one interview about this guy who got really excited because his friends had just told him he needed to go out and read this new novel, Edwin Mulhouse, back in the 70s. And he read it, and he, he was like, wow, this guy really gets it. This is like, he's, he's like uh, Nabokov or Nabokov, however you say his name. Mm-hmm. His, his ability to evoke with an image, and this is like, this is a guy for people who like to read fiction as opposed to just a popular writer, which we'll get to that in a moment too. So what we see in his career is he's, as he's, beginning to get into his writing career is he's not seeking fame. He's not trying to be 
like someone who's really making a whole lot of money off his craft. He's going after after this after. He's going after this narrow path. And um, I think that's really important to keep in mind to kind of understand who Milhauser is. He was going after the narrow path of like not just craft, but like art, the beautiful nature of it, and this long train of the high craft of writing as opposed to the popular craft of writing. As, my, as I understand it, that's kind of the narrative that he fits into as far as literary history goes. Yeah, I mean, you won't find a lot of him explaining himself, but certainly his life bears witness to that and his work does yeah he's very fond of the novella and so i guess a lot of his short stories tend more towards novella length and then they do uh, the short story length well actually in december we'll be talking about novella as an art form because we'll finally get to talk about short stories and novellas we're going to be reading james joyce's dubliners where we have probably the best short stories and the best novella ever written i'll just go ahead and throw that out there now <laughs> but he has a good passage here where he talks about the novella i liked it he said the novella wants nothing to do with the immense the encyclopedic, the all-conquering, all-devouring prose epic, which strikes it as an army moving relentlessly across the land. So he's talking about the novel there. So the novella doesn't do that. Its desires are more intimate, more selective. And when it looks at the short story to which it's secretly akin, it says with a certain cruelty, no, not for me, this admirably exquisite, elegant, refined, perhaps over-refined, delicately nuanced, perfect little world whose perfection depends so much on artful exclusions. It says, let me breathe. The attraction in the novella is that it lets the short story breathe. It invites the possibility of certain elaborations and complexities forbidden by a very short form, while at the same time it holds out with a promise of formal perfection. It's enough to make a writer dizzy with exhilaration. And I think that quote right there really gets at what Milhauser is doing. He's going for effect. He's going to give you this... airy feeling of art and it's hard to put your finger on it but when it's happening you and you are drawn in and when it's over it kind of feels like you were part of a um puppet show or you were just like watching some theater in front of you and it seemed very real at the moment it was interesting i guess we'll talk about this more but i I looked up all the, the reviews that came out at the time of this novel and there were some people that were really angry about the not like they really just rejected it like just like there was one guy in particular that wrote something like i could feel him trying to hypnotize me with his accumulation yes. of details and i didn't like it and i did not want him to uh, basically i just said i don't want to be hypnotized you know give me a break Milhauser. yeah i think i think that's a pretty common reaction from people i've talked to who've who've read Milhauser. it's he he has he is hypnotic and his ability to paint those scenes or to to make you feel like you're a part of his show and to and to keep you there as it slowly goes off the rails into yeah. Milhauser land is it's really it's he's he he is really good at his craft and so you have people I, I, I think a sharp divide. You either really love that sort of thing and are happy to sort of be carried along into the bizarre and fantastic, or you really hate that kind of thing and feel manipulated by it and don't want anything to do with it. Well, it's especially weird with him. And again, I suppose we'll talk more about this later, but he's not like someone like Marilyn Robinson. She's giving you a point in return. She's going to hypnotize you maybe in a not similar way, but she's she, you're going to get some nutrition in return for it. Milhauser, you get to the end of it and you're like, what just happened? I had a dream and yeah. I'm not sure what it meant and I'm not sure what I should do with it, but I sure did feel some things. Yeah, it's, it's, and I think yeah. I feel like that's more true of his short stories than this novel in particular. I feel like this novel actually maybe does have a point or two right. to make, which was surprising to me because, you, like you said, I don't I don't feel that with a Milhauser short story. What I feel like the point is is simply to unsettle you and to make you realize if there's any point, it's to make you realize that you're alive and this world is popping with color and smell and craziness and there's something creepy that you just can't put your finger on right around it's the corner always elusive. it's the, this elusive thing right around the yeah if right just, around the corners imagine really a lot of his short stories of are grasp. actually just descriptions of places like the grand cosmo if you take the section of the grand where he's just describing the grand cosmo had this and this and this and this and this and there was a showdown yeah, there's whole short stories of his that are just lists They're basically very of much like, like that but they start out with like they start out 
just plausible enough that you're like, okay. And then they just each detail, he's like pulling you into the basement of the Grand Cosmo all the time and sucking you in and taking you down to the next level and the next level and the next level. And the farther you go, the wackier and wilder it gets. And the more confused you are about what's real and what's not real. And what's, yeah, what's reality, what's perception, what's, and that's, that's kind of the point is, you know, to make you, maybe it's to make you have an existential crisis of some kind. Maybe that's part of it. You know? I think that is part of it. Yeah. Part of it is just, I don't think he would, uh, he's more art for art's sake. We haven't really talked a whole lot about that, but the whole debate about whether art should have a meaning. I mean, it really is as simple as this, whether art should have a purpose and a meaning or whether art should just be for its own sake, should be beautiful because beauty exists. And the feeling of pleasure that comes with looking at something that's beautiful or experiencing something that beautiful that is beautiful is in and of itself a valuable thing. And you get the feeling that he falls more into that camp. I do think he has some things that he's thinking and trying to say about capitalism and about the pursuit of happiness, but you do see moments where like that long, what is it, five or six pages where he's just describing everything that's in the Grand Cosmo? Is, that, is it the Grand Cosmo that has that virtuoso, it's literally just an unbroken semicolon couple yes. pages where there's no, you don't reach the period until you've heard like pretty sure that's near the end of the book, right? Of, yeah. And so it is, yeah, the, the, I, the fact that it's a lot of details and he's trying to hypnotize you. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I think that is right. It does feel like, well, the short story he's most famous for is the illusionist. And mm-hmm. it kind of feels like he's the magician and he's, he's shuffling cards in front of you and he's, it's very hypnotic and he draws you into his world. But like I said, it's an effect. And as soon as it's done, it's, but, and then it kind of makes it adds an extra layer of interest and intrigue that all his stories are about magicians and tricksters and showmen. And, and that's what he is. And, and that's what he's giving you is yeah. that I mean, experience through his story. Is, I feel dumb that we're probably going to have to ask this question by the end of our our series of podcasts. But one question I think we'll have to ask is, is Stephen Milhouse or Martin Dresler? I mean, is this just a nakedly autobiographical book? And we don't have to answer that right this second. But I think it's one of those, he's, it's one of those books that actually actually demands you to ask that. He's uh, he's definitely one who writes autobiographical stuff. He writes himself into his books. So it's not out of the realm of possibility. Mm-hmm. I guess the only other things to know is he did win the Pulitzer Prize. That's kind of what escalated him into fame. And we talked a whole lot about prizes and literary prizes in prior episodes. So just know that that's it started out as a journalism prize, right? The Nobel or not the Pulitzer? The, the Pulitzer, yeah. Joseph Event. Pulitzer's a newspaper man, I want to yeah, say. Yeah, but then it's now given out to um, the best in American writing each year. Have we read uh, what other Pulitzer Prize winners have we read? Was uh, Robinson one? I think that was, yeah. Was East of Eden have? Is- I don't think the Pulitzer's been around that long. He still teaches. I mean, he's now a teacher. He teaches at Skidmore College. If you want to go learn under Martin Dressler's author, you can. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty much all the uh, biography we have of him. Like I said, there's not a whole lot to be said about him. As- there are interviews of him. I mean, he's not a complete recluse. He will do stuff. I, I have yeah. seen, I saw an interview with him and I actually turned it off because I was like, you know, I basically, spoiler alert, like his hypnotic effect and I don't, and he was being cagey, like he wasn't really giving, he was just, he was telling the interviewer everything without really telling them anything as you would expect that he would do. But I also was just like, I don't want to see this dorky little mustached guy behind the curtain. I, I want to just let him be. Stephen Milhauser, the magician. Gilead was a, a Pulitzer. Gilead was a Pulitzer. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that might be the only other one. That we've done on the bookening. Yeah, I mean, Steinbeck and uh, Hemingway have them, and Faulkner, but for other books. Right. Now the fun job of putting him into his actual context and literary history, because this will take some work to try and figure out what he's doing. We've talked a lot about modernism, so I don't think there's a need to really go over modernism again. Yeah, just listen to every episode of The Bookening Ever, and you'll hear us give a thorough description of modernism. So what we're in now is the period that's well after modernism and is even not necessarily Mm postmodernism. And we've said we've looked at modernism before. We haven't really, besides Robinson, and I don't think we talked a whole lot about modern literature around her because there wasn't a whole lot to be said. But coming out of the 40s, We've looked at stuff in the 40s. And then coming out of that right after World War II, you had 
the malaise and the disenchantment with the world that would become not would become postmodernism. And so modernism was really championing the human mind, the ability to question the past and come up with new forms, but also to show your disenchantment with it some. But postmodernism, it's a turn even away from modernism. It's a questioning reality, questioning truth, questioning the ability to understand in the world. The So you get a lot of the existential philosophies that come with postmodernism. So you would get existential schools of thought in France, where it was all about you create your own self. You have no pre-existing substance or whatever that makes you who you are. What this meant for literature is you get a lot of experimental literature. You get a lot of literature that is either very driven at just being chaotic and weird. And so this is when you get like Hal by Allen Ginsberg. You also get Naked Lunch by William S. Burroughs, which is a book we'll never read on this podcast. But what this is, is as things turn more towards questioning everything, it becomes also very political. And so Naked Lunch, it was uh, brought up on censorship. Allen Ginsberg, he was part of the beat movement, which would give rise to the hippie movement. And so things would were just quickly escalating towards the stuff that would happen in the 60s with civil rights and with art becoming very political. And so you would see that especially with a lot of the... Um, avant-garde literature. And so postmodernism going that way aligns itself with what we think of as avant-garde literature, as the high art, as the stuff that's really obscure and difficult to read. And we see things like that with uh, modernism, and we'll talk even more about it in December with James Joyce. Sure, You have that one train of thought coming out of the 40s. The other train of thought you have coming out of the 40s is more of a personal autobiographical style where the author becomes very much a part of their writing. You also still have the just basic storytelling. So like you said, you had To Kill a Mockingbird. She doesn't really fall into either of those categories, Harper Lee. But what you would get would be guys like, um, oh, let's see here. I had some written down. You would have, well, Revolutionary Road by Richard Yates. Then you would also have, who am I thinking? Oh, Portnoy's Complaint. And he's the big one would be uh, Philip Roth. And he's still writing today. And Philip Roth, he doesn't really fall into the experimental category of literature, but he also isn't just his, um, just the old traditional way of storytelling. With Philip Roth, what you get, well, for one, he also was writing novels that were very scandalous at the time. So Portnoy's Complaint was brought up on obscenity charges. But what he was really about was writing these stories where they're very much about the consciousness of the author. And not necessarily difficult to read, but just the author is very much a part of the story. And so he would have these weird things where he would play with narrative form, where the where he would actually become a character in his story and stuff like that. And so even more mainstream literature was becoming less um, formal and rigid, as you would see it in the realism era. And then out of this, kind of in between the two, you get a form of literature that was kind of trying to be both at the same time, and it's magical realism. I'm just going to interrupt you yeah. before you get there. Uh, we just talked about uh, a month ago, we talked about old uh, G.K. Chesterton. He had a quote that I ju just occurred to me to throw in here into the mix, because I think he, as he did with a lot of things in the 20th century, he called it before it happened. He says, the old fairy tale makes the hero a normal human boy. It is his adventures that are startling. They startle him because he is normal. But in the modern psychological novel, the hero is abnormal. Normal. The center is not central. Hence, the fiercest adventures fail to affect him adequately, and the book is monotonous. You can make a story out of a hero among dragons, but not out of a dragon among dragons. So that's Chesterton's pre-criticism of everything that you're talking about, basically. Yeah, that's right. And so that's kind of, so my point is that the postmodernism was very, it could, on one side, it could be very um, experimental and weird. On the other side, it could seem very normal, but there is a turn in it. And it is towards this sort of narcissistic looking at the author. And also, um, very, psychology was becoming a big thing at the time. So you had Freud, but then his Freud's followers, you had Jacques Lacan, who was very popular at the time. And um, there's a lot of people who try to read stuff like Stephen Milhauser does through the lens of Jacques Lacan. And the point is always about desire and how you see the object and you want it, but you can never have it. So in, I mean, you can see how that applies to Dressler, sure. right? He's looking at these things and you always think you know what you want, but what you want is never really what you're after. And so you never get what you desire. It's, it's what propels you forward, but you never actually get it. And so obviously, I mean, yeah, everything evaporates. As soon as he thinks he's got what he wants, it just disappears. But where was I at? Oh, uh, just postmodernism. I was kind of rambling about postmodern. Oh, magical realism. Right. Magical realism. Yes. We I'm get sorry. this. Yeah. We get this wonderful form of art called magical realism. And 
the father of it is Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Borges was actually probably the real father of it. But Gabriel Garcia Marquez comes around in the 60s and he writes 100 Years of Solitude, which is the one book that I wish I could recommend that I can't. Such a good book, but nobody should read it. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's too bad. It's too bad. I stopped reading it and I loved it until yeah. I stopped reading it. <laughs> but so you get some of these tor- sorts of novels, magical realism, where you're taking reality, but you're kind of also twisting it, playing with time, playing with playing with narrative forms, but especially playing with you ha- let magical aspects enter into the real world. From my understanding, a lot of um, Stephen Milhauser's short stories kind of work with this, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And so you get this form, magical realism, because one thing that postmodernism did bring in to to literature was this idea that you could play with form, that you didn't have to stay so committed to the old ways of doing things. You could play with time. You could let authors be a part of their stories. You could suddenly back up. There's one famous, I think it's by, oh, who wrote it? Fowler, maybe? I'm trying to remember what the book is. But there's a part of it where he actually stops, and it's like he stops the reel of the story, and he walks in, and he starts just talking to you as the author. People are just doing these weird things like this, and it's the idea that you can play with your – I mean, it's as silly as it sounds. The authors can play. They can have fun. Yeah, So, you, but you get magical realism, and you get postmodernism, and both the uh, idea that you can never really have truth or reality, so you may as well have art. That's kind of the tenet of postmodernism. But then you also get the idea that you can play with form and have fun with it, and create and invent. You get both of these things and they come and they combine. And well, in my understanding of the book I just read, you get Stephen Milhauser. So is he a purely postmodern writer? I don't think he's postmodern in the sense that we think of like Thomas Pynchon as postmodern. He's very classical in the way that he presents. I mean, yeah. he's he's not going to break in and, and, and do anything weird with, you know, with narrative forms or anything like that. But that's right. But is he postmodern in the sense that like, uh, the, yeah. Philip Roth or John Updike, that these guys are postmodern, so that they take the old forms, but they have a very postmodern ethic to it. And I mean, now we're even in post-postmodernism, but right. but yeah, I just wanted to, we hadn't really touched on postmodernism ever. I felt like to really understand where Stephen Milhauser's coming from, you kind of have to have a brief flyby of it. And I think magical realism is, is helpful too, because if you don't know what that is, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's anchored to reality enough that it doesn't just become a god gothic novel or a fantasy novel so it's that's the realism part but there yeah. is, there all are also these magical things i don't know how else to say yeah it. it's well like, another really great proponent of it is this italian writer called italo calvino right and he wrote this book called the baron in the trees i think i've mentioned it before and it's where this french baron one day as a young boy decides on a dare or on He's angry at his parents or something. He says he's going to go live in the trees and he's never going to come down again. And so the rest of the novel is just showing how he stays committed to this, how he lives in the tops of the trees and never comes down. And so um, with Midnight's Children, it's a story about the Indian Revolution where they declared independence from Britain. And it's about this one boy who's starting to grow elephant ears and an elephant. It's it's interesting. It's a good story. But well, and uh, Marquez, is it um, 100 Years of Solitude or um, the other one, Love in the Time of Cholera, that starts with the old man and the parrot? That is 100 Years of Solitude. There's just this old dude with a parrot, and it's just, there's nothing magical about the parrot. I'm just trying to think of examples of how to even explain this concept, but it's just kind of his relationship with the parrot and the history of the parrot and everything is just dialed up in a way that reads as very real and psychologically works, but it's also just a little bit fantastical and colorful in a way that illuminates real life without actually being realis- realism. Yeah, you know. it's uncanny. It, yeah. it pushes the limits just enough that it feels like it's kind of real, but there's something happening that makes it seem like reality's beginning to disappear. It's the grand cosmo. I mean, the grand yeah. Walt Disney has basically done all that stuff, but at the same time, the way Milhauser describes it, there's something kind of weird like could you actually do all this stuff? Does it, you know, you just, you feel like you're in a dream or something like that somehow, even though there's nothing that absolutely ever tips the hand. 
Yeah. And also for that other branch of postmodernism I was talking about, I don't know why I forgot to mention this guy. If you really want to understand that branch of postmodernism, just go read Samuel Beckett. The sort of despair, but also playing with form. Any play by Samuel Beckett. Waiting for Godot. Yep. They wait for Godot. You just have two guys talking about the fact that they're waiting for Godot and Godot never shows up. And that's the play. Hilarious. You have another one where two people are like stuck waist deep in a garbage pile. And they're just talking about the fact that they're stuck waist deep in a garbage pile. Another one is this old man who keeps doing tape recordings of himself in his house. And they like there's stuff with bananas that happen. And it's all absurdist and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But that's the point. His life doesn't make sense. So art should reflect life. And so therefore, why should art make sense? So that's not necessarily what you get with Dressler, but it could be. Or is it? Yeah. (laughs) Could be that with all the dreams that he's trying to create for you, he's just showing you that your life itself is just this imaginative vapor that lives around your head. And that if you were ever to snap out of it, you would realize it's meaningless. I don't know. Well, we're going to have to sort that out for people. What do you say? Let's try. <laughs> sort uh, out whether or not life is a vapor. <laughs> well, I think no. we can. T- I think we can tell them right now that that's not right. Nope. Well, uh, uh, sure it is. James Four. Uh, that's life true. Says life is a vapor. Life, life is a vapor. There we go. <laughs> it's like a direct quote from Ecclesiastes, but it has meaning behind it. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> Yes, it does. <laughs> That's the part that was wrong. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, There's an author guiding this story. Right. That's right. What's that sound? Hi, it's the airplane going over. Indicating baggage check, part of the show where we discuss the baggage that we brought to this book. Jake, what baggage did you bring to Martin Dressler by Stephen Milhauser? Well, I've read a number of Milhauser short stories. I read Dangerous Laughter. I have another compilation of short stories of his that I've read. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, it was an omnibus of yeah, all the best yeah, stories right. from... Was, yeah, so like some of them were from Dangerous Laughter, and then there were other ones. It had We Others, and the which was the story about the ghost man, and then it had um, the Barnum Museum, which is a very famous yeah, one about yep, yep, yep. just a big building with full of wonders. In case you can't tell, Nathan's the one who's fed me Milhauser and knows <laughs> better what I've read of Milhauser than I do. Um, so yeah, I came with, with that, and so I came with uh, an expectation to be uh, on a wild ride, sort of wondering if he was going to take a long time building up to the wildness or if he was going to try to sustain the wild ride for novel length. But that was, in my mind, those were the two options. That's what you, you get. This, you get a wild ride with Milhauser. And so is he going to try to sustain that for a whole novel? And am I going to just feel sick to my stomach by the time the ride's done? Or is it going to be a slow build up with a big payoff? You want to just answer that question right it was now? Definitely, he was definitely going for the slower build up with the bigger payoff. It was an expanded short story. Like what he, what he does in a short story is expanded over the length of a novel and slow plays it. To me, it, it feels- success, successfully, but... It feels like, I mean, I don't, I, I always it hate. It gives you, sorry, go, oh, ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, no. Oh, I was just going to say, it feels like, I, I always hate speculating. I think it's completely pointless and authors famously say that people always get it wrong. But, so I'm not saying this is what happened. I'm just saying what it feels like. It feels like he had two short stories. One of them was about these weird sisters and the other one was about the Grand uh, Cosmo. The Grand Cosmo. And he thought, hey, I can put these together and maybe make something out of it. And tell a bigger story with a bigger point. And yeah, I think that, you know, it's probably totally wrong, but there's a reason that you'd feel that way. And yeah, especially if you've read his fiction, you've read stories like the one about the sisters. The sisters and, and ones like the Grand Cosmo. And those are kind of the two kinds of, he usually, he, he in the collection Dangerous Laughter, it's actually divided into sections. And there's one section that's just called, I don't remember what it's called, but it's just about weird places and it's descriptions of yeah. big stores, big, and then there's one about crazy inventors. And then he usually does a, some stuff about childhood and about relationship. You know, he does the more relational he, stuff. He really too. cares about these worlds. And what he wants to do is it's all about magnification, right? So he's either going to take a telescope to something big that's far away and just like pull it up, or he's going to take a microscope to something small and again, blow it up. Right. And so you're either dealing with like miniatures, things just beyond what the eye can see or things that are so big, they, they try to contain the world and become indistinguishable between, you know, what's the created thing versus what's the world or the reality. Like, yeah, yeah. I and think the great cosmos is the se- obviously in that second category. Right. There's one about a store that comes into town. I think in dangerous laughter, no, maybe not dangerous. I don't know. There's a sh- story of his that's about 
a big store that rolls into town and becomes an all-consuming store and ends up eating the town and basically like the Grand Cosmo. People live in the store. They have there's and the store is underground. And then the score is this, yeah. And then there's a dome over the. Or am I confusing two stories? I might be confusing. He, he two does stories. a lot of stories like this. Yeah. So like, there's one where it's like they create this whole underground world with streets and artificial lights, parking garage that goes down, 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 and everybody sort of gets sucked in and wants to be a part of huh. it. And then there's another one where they like they dome it off and they have an artificial sun or something like right. that. And he likes to just do stuff like that. Like the Truman Show. Big. What do you say? Like the Truman Show. Like the Truman Show. <laughs> but he would never give you the satisfaction of the the didactic point that the Truman Show makes. You know, uh, there's one about people that build a tower. They just keep building it, and they keep they build their civilization on the tower. And the narrator of the story is living on a level up at the tower, such that he could spend his entire life going down, and he would never actually reach. He would die before he got right. to the bottom. Yeah. Um, huh. So he likes to do stuff like that. He also has a good line in his other line, which is more along the lines of sister. The sister story is he likes to do stories about adolescence and about uh, sexual awakening. kind of sexual awakening. There's a really good story, one of the best stories in Dangerous Laugh is about 12 or 13 year old boy that becomes friends with a girl who's just sitting in the dark oh yeah and oh yeah i don't remember what the setup is why he why she's like that she's sick or something so he goes in he talks to her you know she's she's 12 or 13 she's his age they develop this really close bond she has to be in the dark for some reason so he just goes into the dark and is sort of caressed by her voice and they learns to love her and, and then at the end of the story and this is more of a point a twilight zoney kind of point than milhauser usually gives you i think but at the end of the story he can't bear to have a he, he, he never wants to you know she's going to come out of the dark and he runs away and never never talks to her again because whatever was awakened in him was awakened in the dark and he can't yeah so he does that kind of stuff and that was a spooky one and that i mean that really is the thing about this guy and the the people who don't like him they have a point he's the kind of guy that will take you places right and he'll take your heart and your mind places that well that aren't good they're just not good sometimes well he has a good line in childhood one thing that i think i did see an interview with him the one helpful thing he said in an interview is he said i remember going to the museum of What's the big museum that has all the dinosaurs? Smithsonian? I don't know. He went to one of the big New York museums that has like Triceratops and T-Rex bones. And he stood in it and he was overwhelmed by the size and the immensity of it. And he says, once you're an adult, it becomes prosaic. But what I'm going to do in my stories is build you a museum that's build you a building that's big enough that it suddenly snaps you back to that wonder you had when you first went into a shopping mall as a four-year-old and you realized there was this entire world. I'm going to evoke that for you. And it's something that you've forgotten. And mm-hmm. I think he's really connected yeah, to that absolutely. and good. And I appreciate that about him. He also does it in a, with sex, which is where I think he gets dangerous. I'm going to remind you what it was like, how dangerous and weird and untethered it actually felt to be hit puberty and just go flying off into space. That's what Araby is like, actually, in uh, Dubliners. I loved that. St- oh, <laughs> not to get off the rails, no, but no, I love that story. You've read it now? I've not, but I've read I'm, about I, it. I've heard about it before. Yeah, I'm just... Well, it, it and the dead are the two that mm-hmm. Dubliners is remembered for. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it... It's like all of a sudden I'm a 12-year-old boy again, totally crushing on a girl. Mm-hmm. You forget about that. You forget what it feels like. And well, the specific... There it is. I guess I'll tell, say my baggage with Milhauser. I... F- I read a New York Times, I think, review. Thank you, New York Times, of, of of Dangerous Laughter, which is what introduced me to the idea of Stephen Milhauser. And it was such a – it just described some of the stories. And I thought, oh, this sounds fantastic. So I went out and got it. And I instantly just fell in love with the guy. But I do think he appeals to a lot of good things and some maybe questionable things. I sort of feel like he – yeah, when it comes to that kind of stuff, like I just remember – But it's always like – it's never outright erotic. Right. It's so never... we'll talk about it. Like, you know, when Martin, and we can talk about this later, but when Martin loses his virginity, which is a thing that happens, it's all there, but it's all just outside of the scope of what you see. So much so that, I don't know if you guys, I wondered what exactly yeah. happened. Oh, yeah. I with the too. old, with the rich lady that pretended yeah. to be sick or whatever. Yeah. I yeah. wondered what exactly happened. And it could be read anyway. And, and then you find, find out, out later, later yeah. what happened 
And you're like, yep, that's what it really was all. It was yeah. all there, but you know, right. it also wasn't. You know. Yeah, it's, it's very defined. It's, it's very, very unsettling. Implied. He's trying to do. He's always trying to do the thing that Brandon talks about. And you were talking about this in Boys of Blur, actually, which is give the right details. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so. Yeah. Well, one of the best examples of this. It's one of the early scenes where he sees the actors in the hallway. Mm-hmm. They like to rehearse at strange hours. Sometimes it didn't come in till four in the morning. You saw all kinds of queer things in this line of work. And as Martin stepped out into the hot sunlight of the street, he recalled with sudden vividness a curious detail. Through one of the half-open doors, he had seen the corner of a bed with a pair of crossed feet on it, one of which was naked and white, and one of which wore a shiny black button-up shoe. And that's the way the chapter ends. Right. It's just, <laughs> you're left with this detail, and it feels like it's supposed to mean something. Right. But I mean, well, but everybody knows that... I. I it, sat there and tried to think through whether there was like any meaning behind it. And I just came to the conclusion that no, that was just the weird evocation of feeling you get from an image. Well, and also it's, it's the weird evocation of feeling that you get when you work this bizarre late shift job at a hotel and you're seeing all these weird people and you walk by doors with that are cracked open and happen to glance inside. And yeah, you know, I, was, like I was, I was, I was a night shift janitor. Yeah. It is completely dream. I mean, it's just like weird. He does a nice job of evoking that kind of stuff. It's just that, uh, but that kind of marks the weird uncertainty that just is throughout the book. Well, um, we're going to talk a lot more about this in upcoming episode or episodes. Oh, bag- I'm sorry, Brandon, what baggage did you bring to this book? I brought no baggage to Milhauser. I had never read him. I had barely heard of him. I have a strange relationship with modern literature. I don't really read a whole lot of contemporary stuff. I never have. I've tried to get into the habit of it and just haven't been able to do it. So I read smatterings here and there. So I've read guys like Richard Rousseau. It was pretty good. I liked Empire Falls was fine. But I guess Cormac McCarthy is the most contemporary writer that I read mm-hmm. frequently. And um, it's kind of like with 4,000 years worth of great books to have to sift through in a lifetime. What, why are you going to bother with something that hasn't already really stood the test of time? I mean, yeah. I know that's simplistic, but that's kind of No, it's not simplistic. I, I just it. don't. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so probably the first time I heard of Milhauser was, I'm guessing, from the same person who Jake has talked to about Milhauser and has told him what he doesn't like and likes about it. Yeah. We'll talk more about that. So, our friend's reaction and what we think about it later. Uh, uh, he recommended that I read The Knife Thrower years ago. I never got around to it because I didn't have a copy for whatever reason. And this is the first time I've read him. That's my baggage with Milhauser. I've got plenty of baggage with postmodern literature, stuff that fits into this category. I've read Philip Roth. He's fine. Did you find yourself uh, giving yourself easily to Milhauser or were you yeah, resisting? More easily than I do some of the other postmodern stuff that I've read. Um, I mean, I like, I like, uh, I'm thinking of the right book, Remains of the Day. Yeah. That's the one that was made into Anthony an Anthony Hopkins, Hopkins movie. Yeah, yeah. Yep. That's a really fantastic book. Mm-hmm. And, um, oh, what's his name? Wrote Flaubert's Parrot. Julian Barnes. He's really good too. So some of these guys are, uh, midnight, like I said, Midnight's Children. It's, you would at one point have made my top 10 list. But yeah, this is the first time I've read Milhauser. I've read a lot of people that are in his strain. Updike, I think, is pretty similar to him. Mm-hmm. He's got a, uh, I keep just going back to this feeling. It's almost like a dream feeling, like you're in this. Mm-hmm. Well, to me, he, he, do, he does something with words that none of these guys are doing. Like when you're reading Rushdie or you're reading um, Marquez, you know that the story is not supposed to necessarily be something that actually happened, but you're still supposed to enter the world like a Dickens novel and go along with it. With him, you feel like you weren't from the beginning really supposed to go along with it, but he just sort of puts you on a, under a spell. And when it's over, you realize what's been happening. It's strange. Yeah. It's really uncanny. And that's, I like him. I think I approach my, some of maybe my baggage is that I like, like horror stories I've always enjoyed. And one of the principal things I've enjoyed, enjoyed about them is the feeling of the un- uncanny, but they always have to give you the grotesque in order to get you to the uncanny. Stephen Melhauser is one of the only people I know that without being grotesque, without being demonic, can evoke that weird dream uncanniness that's just really pushes some button inside me that almost nobody else can. He's one of those writers that I'm almost loath to talk about, loath to share with people because he's mine. He's writing like just for me. He's 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 maybe the writer that's I feel like just 
knows how to play me like a piano, almost like nobody else can. In some sense, this is my favorite book that we read this year, just because not, I don't think, I don't think I would take a step back and say it's the best. It's not, it's maybe one of the worst compared to all the great stuff we've read, Anna Karenina, Heart of Darkness, whatever. But just in terms of somebody that can get past my defenses, this guy can do it. And it's just, I don't know what it is exactly. Just even the color. Nobody else uses color like this guy. I mean, he just like, he tells you what color everything is. And that's in, that's amazing. Like you can see the reds and the greens and the yellows and these bright primary colors in his stories that he describes for you. I can't think of another author that gives you color like he gives you. And there are images that I remember from his short stories where it's just like an apple rolling down a hill or something like that. And it's just very vivid. Yeah, I don't know that I've read anybody so evocative ever. I think I can say that without saying that this was the best book we've read or my favorite book that we've read. No, it's not. It's not. Um, mm-hmm. it just. But he's just, in terms of being just pure ability to evoke an image, a feeling, a sensation. Right. I'm not sure he has his equal. I also love the time period. And so to have somebody that can be this transporting and just put me in pre New York, New York with carriages going by Mm -hmm. and horse dung in the streets and little cigar shops that have this certain smell and the smell of leather and the hotel lobby and the Vanderlyn. I actually, it's it's interesting as much as I love the uncanny, it's really the early parts of the book that just made me think, Oh, I love this guy again, because it's just like, it's just so much fun to be in this rich old world. The other the other thing I do want to say about that though is that when it comes to being evocative, I actually don't think Dressler's is best. No, not remotely. Yeah. So anybody who that is like, I didn't know who Stephen Melhauser was. I read Martin Dressler for the first time. This is my fir- first experience of him, and I'm not sure, quite sure, I buy that from you. I, when I when I when I said that, I wasn't even thinking about no, Martin thinking Dressler. About I was the thinking, stories from Dangerous I was thinking, Laughter. I was mostly. thinking about the stories from Dangerous yeah. Laughter first. Yeah. And well, you, you see it here. I don't, I'm not trying to say it's not it's not here, but just in terms of, I mean, I still this super evocative stuff. Yeah, that kid that's sitting in the darkness with the girl, like yeah. you feel the weight. You of feel it in your gut. Darkness. It's like, what would it be like to start a relationship? Well, with you someone? bring it up, and I don't. I still don't really remember everything about that plot, but I remember how I felt when I read it, and it's a feeling in the pit of my stomach. That it's a dream. It's like a nightmare where you can't. You're not so scared that you... It's like one of those dreams that lasts after you wake up and you can't quite shake it. Hmm. Oh, speaking of which, I I wanted to say this in baggage and maybe we'll talk about it later. I have a recurring dream about being in a place very much like the Grand Cosmo. I haven't had it in a long time. It's like Hmm. before reading this, I would have compared it to like if you've been to City Museum in St. Louis, either of you have, neither of you have. City Museum in St. Louis is a lot like the Grand Cosmo, actually. That's the one that has like the glass, just like lots of cool, fun, gimmicky kind of, uh, you can go out on the glass ceiling over the sky. Yeah, and it's got an actual cave system within the building. Like, so you go into the caves or you go into like these weird, bizarre places and that are themed and they're like uh, circus acrobats running around and doing bizarre things. And it's, it's pretty surreal. It's it's super fun. It's super cool. And you can just get lost in there for a day. And I took my whole family and I did, one of my kids did get lost, was quickly found. They're really good because there are all these tunnels and all these ways that you can just wander off and disappear. And they probably have to have the apparatus in place. They to do deal with that all the time. They do. And they've got people watching and they make you put your phone number on. Every kid, they they put a band on every kid with their name and parents' names and phone number. And within a minute of having, not being able to find Ian, I got a text or a phone call, one of the two, I don't remember which, and told where to go. And there he was with two people. <laughs> so yeah, we're, I guess we're... Th- I have seven kids. It's hard, guys. <laughs> <laughs> the struggle is real. Um, I'll just go ahead and tell the story. What had happened was I, I was taking Peter and Lucy to the cave system, and Ian 
had asked Amanda if he could tag along with us. And she said, sure. He ran up. I said, no, buddy. Uh, Because there's like a one of the, we wanted to go down a slide that's like 10 stories tall or something like that. We talked to some kids who said it was terrifying and they're like in the nine to 10 year old and Ian's five, right? And so I was just, no, buddy, we're, we're not going to do that because I don't want to get once you stuck at the top of a 10 story slide. And I, I said, go back to mom. Well, mom wasn't looking for him at that point. And it wasn't that far away, but he took a wrong turn, which is really easy to do. Sure. Anyhow, it's a wild, crazy place like that with themed or whatever. But anyhow, I have a, I have a recurring dream of a place like that that's sort of crossed with like the cavern system of the Goonies, but it starts in this big old like house. And I always know when I'm in the dream, when I get in this series of rooms and then I know, I always know how to find, I can never piece it back together, but I always know how to find this one little secret door that takes me into this other world inside the world. But anyhow, uh, (laughs) it's, it was a recurring dream from a really long time ago. But I felt all of the weird, uncanny scariness of that, or whatever, of that dream. I was reminded of it. Hadn't thought about that dream for years, but... It's funny that you mentioned that, because I've been... It's hard to describe this, but there's a dream, There's a recurring dream, or not a recurring dream, just a very vivid dream from my early childhood that's been hitting me with full force since reading this book. And it's just a dream where my parents leave me at a park, and the sun is going down, and I'm a little kid, and I'm alone at the park, and and there's just this intense, not fear, but just uh, aloneness, unsafeness, but but just uncanny kind of uns- Just like the world is not a place where my parents can always protect me. There's something strange. That's kind of the feeling that's always que- creeping at the edges of Millhauser. And some, so for whatever reason, this dream has just been like hitting me a lot. I've, I've thought about it a number of times since while reading this book and since reading this book. It's fun, the baggage that you don't know you bring to a book. Yeah. I feel like I had that with just a bizarre dream that I'd had, with, which is really, I think, part of the point of what Millhauser does is he's trying to tap into those kinds of experiences mm-hmm. that we all do have right. somewhere or another. Um, so. He's very good at it. Yeah, these dreams. Do I have to tell one now? <laughs> you got one? <laughs> My recurring dream, we went to one of those big Baptist churches when I was growing up, and my dream would be, I would be in it alone, there would be all these long hallways with those like soft gray lights, Mm -hmm. and I would just wander down them and then go up like these steep stairs, and you would end up in this really dark baptismal, but it was almost like a cathedral too over you. Mm -hmm. It just felt like there was a presence there, and it was watching you. I never knew what it was, but it always felt like it was around a corner, and it would always get darker, and the hallways would get a little darker, and the stairs would get steeper as you would keep going along. Long. And then finally, you would end up like in this cathedral area and you would always try to avoid. But every time you would go in, there would be something there waiting and watching. <laughs> and you never could see it. It was terrifying. That's awful. <laughs> the book getting today was written and produced by. <laughs> Boogie Day was written and produced by Nathan Iverson. It was performed by Nathan Iverson, Brent Chastain, and Jacob Menzel. And uh, you can go to warhornmedia.com to find lots more great content. Listen to Sound of Sanity, another fine podcast featuring Jacob Menzel, the pastor who's master of reading, not in his full reading capacity, but in his full pastor capacity. You can listen to other great things and do other great things. You can give us money at patreon.com forward slash the what, Brandon? Bookening. The Bookening. Thanks for listening, everybody. 